Hello, welcome to Take One with Shebs. On this edition of the podcast, I welcome back Tarek Hussein, who's going to be discussing with us about his new book, Ramadan Mubarak. I delved into why he decided to write this book. Tarek also came on my show this time last year to discuss his journey. We also talked about Ramadan. You can watch the episode on the description below. Before we go into the discussion, here's how you can support the channel. You can support the channel by heading over to www.shebstherwonder.com. You'll be able to see the store tab, which you can hover over to and click. You can then buy various items from t-shirts, jumpers, hoodies, even water bottles and phone cases. If you have any questions, you can send me a message through the contact tab. Now that's out the way, sit back and enjoy the talk. Tarek, welcome back to the show. It's great to have you on again. This time last year, we had I had you on to discuss Ramadan and about your journey as well. But today we're going to be discussing your new book, which is Ramadan Mubarak, and I had the pleasure of reading it. So before we go into that, how are you anyway? How are you in general? Yeah, good. Very, very excited now that Ramadan is finally upon us. Um, you know, it's my favorite time of the year. I'm really, really looking forward to it. It's been a busy year, and it's a month when we know our connection with with God is is beyond anything that we're experiencing the rest of the year we're we're all kind of super super happy to see the arrival of ramadan today we'll talk more about the book and ramadan itself and what ramadan sort of means to you muslims as well you just explained a little bit why ramadan is so important what is it about ramadan for you and you said it's your favorite time of the year what what gets you excited Um, about it we often as Muslims, as you know, Shebs, we often refer to Ramadan as a gift. And and many people from outside might be looking in and thinking, hold on a minute, you all walk around looking like zombies because you've hardly slept, you know, up all night in the mosque. You're, 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 you know, you, you're, you're suffering from caffeine withdrawing those first few days. Um, you're hungry. It all looks so painful sometimes from the outside, as it did for us as children when we used to contemplate it. But in reality, when you get beyond it and you start to begin to understand the wisdom of this month, the fact that once a year we are forced as Muslims to stop. Because, of course, Ramadan is an obligation. It's not something you choose to do. You, 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 strictly speaking, most Muslims accept that you have to do it. And why do we have to do it? Because it forces us to stop. It forces us to press reset. It forces us to start contemplating what are our attachments? What are the things we have become a bit too attached to that might be weighing us down from a spiritual perspective, of course? Because Ramadan, although the over image is about fasting, which, by the way, in itself is is an ancient wisdom. This is this is. You know, this transcends Islam in many ways. It's something that was practiced by all the major religions. And I don't think it's a coincidence. In fact, the Quran acknowledges this in in um, in the second surah. It, it makes it clear that, and I'm paraphrasing here, that, you know, this is something that has been prescribed to us just as it was prescribed to people before us. So everybody knows that this is an ancient wisdom. You know, you come out of Ramadan able to do away with vices that maybe you've struggled with the rest of the year. I, and I'm talking from personal experience. For, for many years, I was a smoker. And actually, it was Ramadan that really helped me. And I'm using the smoking metaphor because it's in the same way there are other vices in our lives, whether it's too much attachment to our devices, whether it's, you know, um, too much attachment to, to other worldly things. Ramadan is a wonderful time to reset all of that and and to start reflecting and to start looking into ourselves. And and it's no surprise that, you know, this is a month that is all about charity. It's all about giving. But of course, the other thing, Shebs, that you and I both know as as people uh, who are part of the Muslim community, it's such a wonderfully festive time as well. You know, there's this great atmosphere in our communities where everyone's coming together. You have these wonderfully large communal iftars. You have these huge late night gatherings in the mosques. You know, people start to put their differences aside. It's a month of forgiveness. It's a month of giving. And I think in that you really see the essence of Islam in the month of Ramadan. And that that, that I think is the main reason that I'm, you know, I, I love the month so much. For you as a as a travel writer, and we spoke about this in your in our last interview. You travel, you you write, you were telling you're telling us that you were writing books at the time, and that was the, the that was the main message I got at the end of our discussion. You did actually say that's that, that was what you're gonna be doing going forward. But as a travel writer, what 
you just told us why Ramadan is so so special to you. But why was it so important to write a book like this and yeah, so have it have, I mean, it, have it published to the world? Exactly. So so a lot of people have said, you know, you're a travel writer, maybe a historian, even in the way that I write the kind of material I normally write. Why am I writing something like this? Well, what, one of the journeys I wrote about um, recently in, in of course, a, a, another book by the same publisher was about the Hajj. And, and, and I wrote about the Hajj and, and, and what that meant to me and, and how deeply spiritual that experience was. And the reality is, for me, you know, Ramadan is also a journey. The, the book is also taking you on a journey. It's, it, as most people will, will know, those that have bought it, this isn't a book with a narrative. This isn't a book with any kind of um, structure in that respect. It's simply a book of inspirational quotes. It's got verses from the Quran, Hadith, and verses from various individuals throughout history alongside tips. So it's really about taking you on a journey, very much a kind of spiritual journey through the book and through the month of Ramadan. And in many ways, often when I travel, and one of the main reasons I began to travel, and I use the word travel rather than holidaying, because of course they, they have different meanings. And in my head, when I'm traveling, I'm, I'm doing more than just physically moving. I'm also going on a journey internally, because wherever I travel, I try to take something away from that. I try to come away a different person. And I think, um, and without going into too many cliches here, I think a lot of people, when they talk about travel in that slightly, what we might call pretentious way, they, they often refer to this idea of, you know, traveling to find themselves. You know, the, the gap year student or or the person who's having that kind of um, internal crisis, you know, existential crisis, and they start to become more introspective and whatever. We hate listening to them sitting around the campfire on a beach somewhere in Thailand, maybe. But the reality is that is really why they are on the road, even if we suspect they haven't found it. Now, Ramadan takes us on that journey as an individual through the pres prescribed rites and the things that we're supposed to do. So for me, there is another journey happening here. When you, are, when you enter Ramadan as a Muslim, when you take upon yourself the, the obligations you're supposed to do and you understand the wisdom behind them, it's also a journey. The book itself, the, it's not a traditional book. You're not going to be, able, you're not going to be reading a, a story that you've written on your journey. It's, as you said, that there's phrases there that you've written and a lot of it is from female voices as well and it's quite important that you you included female voices and tell us why that was that was important to have that in this book as you pointed out this is a book you might dip into and dip out you know um throughout the year even throughout ramadan and it's the, it's exactly the kind of book i would actually sometimes carry with me um alongside my other travel literature it was just a book that in those moments when i when i just wanted to sit and think about things or or reflect i would dip into it but coming back to what you were saying yes for me it was really important you know um I'm first of all, I'm the father of daughters, so I've got to answer to them anyway. OK, I, I, but I wanted to make sure that when I put in all these quotes from inspiring figures from the past, that I at least managed to get as many female voices in as male. And, and I'm going to be blunt here. I had to work really hard to do that. You know, I had to go really deep into a lot of the historical sources. And often, often, sadly, I was I was um, bringing through voices of individuals who we knew almost nothing about. And this isn't, let's be clear, this isn't an exclusively Islamic issue. Female voices from the past in any culture are often obscure, neglected, and barely acknowledged, okay? And, and I just feel like there's such a richness within the Islamic female tradition. There are so many great voices with so much wisdom, and I, I've been lucky enough as part of this book to research many of them, that, you know, we, we need to highlight these a lot more. And, and we need to give our daughters, our mothers, our sisters, our aunts, more and more individuals that they can relate to in that way as well. Because you do have, a, it's a mixture of male and female voices, yeah. but give us examples of some of the female yeah, voices. Yeah, so some, right? some of the individuals, you know, go right, back to the beginning of what we what we might call the kind of um, Islamic tradition. So there's this particular individual known as Rabia, um, Rabia of Basra. She's this great early female mystic seen as the kind of almost the very first female mystic known for her extreme piety and virtue, very much an ascetic and who, who would often put other ascetics to shame. But again, 
This person is, you know, when when we look at the history books, this person is half myth. I mean, sorry, half legend, half, you know, um, second hand, third hand information. So we're really struggling. And a lot of uh, a lot of the quotes, if I'm blunt, that are attributed to her, there's no way of knowing for certain that they come from her. And then, you know, moving a bit more into a modern era, because I, I don't just put ancient, I put, I try to work through the ages. Um, one, one of my one of my favorite um, quotes in, in the entire um, book is by someone called Hatis um, Chenan Hanim, who's a 19th century female Turkish mystic. And, and the quote goes, if you give a poor person money before it drops into his or her hand, it falls into God's hands. And I remember the first time I read that, you know, often the simplest, most obvious statements, it's the way they're phrased. It just hits you. You know, this idea that when we give to, to charity, we're actually not giving it to the individual we think we're giving it to. It's actually going to the divine first because it's the divine that's holding it, um, th their hand out in that moment. You know what I mean? Um, and right up to the modern period, you know, um, there's Dr. Haifa Yunis, who, who is... Um, well known today um, amongst the contemporary Islamic voices. And her quote, again, is one that really um, blew me away, you know. And again, it's the simplicity. What you do in your good time will come to you in your difficult time. I did the same with the, with the male voices in there as well. One of the things you've also done is you've included British voices as well as if, you, if people, again, listen to our last interview, your, your background's from Bangladesh, my background's from Bangladesh as well. So you've included a lot of British and Bangladeshi voices as well. Again, tell us why that was also important to include. The, ob the obvious thing is because of your background as well, but it, tell us why it was important to have that in the book as well. I mean, like you say, the obvious is we're, we're both British Bangladeshis, um, and this is a part of our heritage. You know, heritage is a big, big feature in my work generally anyway, and it wasn't just going to go away because I'm doing this kind of work now. I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to make these individuals more visible. I wanted people to know who these individuals are, because when it comes to historic British Muslim voices, it, it, we, we barely know any of them in the popular domain. And the same for Bangladeshi, um, you know, Muslim voices. They're almost unknown. So I, I went for some some. You could argue one of them is relatively well known. Marmaduke Pictou, the, the famous um, Quran translator is in there. You've got Lord Headley, the, the uh, much lesser known, who was a friend of his, one of the early lordly converts. Um, then you've got Lady Zainab Evelyn Cobalt, who's who's the famous um, who's famous for being the first female Hadji. Um, they're the kind of British convert voices that I wanted to bring in because I know that when people read the quote, when they see the name, they're then going to go and look these people up and they're going to learn a little something about their own heritage. And I did the same with the Muslim voices. You know, we've got um, Kazi Nazrul Islam, who is actually, um, you know, the, the kind of national poet of Bangladesh. But yet most most British Bangladeshis know very little about him, known as the rebel poet, you know. And then, and then I, I, as a, as a Sileti, I couldn't resist, you know, bring, <laughs> bringing in a Sileti voice. Um, and, and not a lot of people know this, but Sileti is actually quite, quite well known for its, um, you know, tradition of of mystics and and wandering wayfarers, and and I picked someone who's relatively well known in Silet, but maybe not outside, and that's Hassan Raja, this this kind of village mystic whose words just blew me away the first time I read them. And and it, what was what's really important for me as as a British Bangladeshi um, and a Sileti was that this is somebody who was speaking in my true native tongue. You know, he he, he writes his stuff in Sileti, not in Bangla. And 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 for those of us who are who are silly, appreciate what I mean by that. You know, um, his words are exactly the 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 language of our parents. Whereas when somebody like Kazi Nazrul Islam, who who wrote in formal um, Bangla, would write his work, it's a little bit more difficult for us. And whilst you were writing this, you, you've also included the Quran and and the Hadith as well. So. What for you stands out in the book? I mean, there's, there's loads that you've written, but what, what stands out for you for the most and why? This this was the more difficult thing because um, I'm I'm not a, a scholar of Quran. I'm not a scholar of Hadith. I'm not even a scholar of Islam. So and and I didn't want to pretend to be. Just just, just tell people people might not know what this is, but what is what is a Hadith? And yeah, sure yeah. people know what sure. a Quran um, is. As well. so obviously, most people know a Quran. We're, we're talking about the verses from the Quran, but a Hadith in the Islamic tradition is a tradition of the Prophet. It's something that the Prophet did said 
or, um, and somebody else may have observed it and then recorded it. It was often recorded long after his death. That should also be pointed out. Um, and, and there's a whole kind of science behind how those things were collected. But we, as Sunnis, predominantly, we need both of these um, scriptures in order to construct the law that we follow, to put it in its simplest terms. And this is why there is huge reverence across the globe, not just for the Quran, but also hadiths. Um, and that's what you, you've, you've mentioned here. Um, but both of them are holy scriptures. And it's very, very important that people appreciate I'm not trying to interpret these. And in my book, you, you, you know yourself, Chefs, from having looked at it. I just simply put the verses there and leave it open to interpretation because we, we have very highly qualified people to do that. Um, but there are a couple of, um, you know, verses in there that obviously stand out for me. One of my favorite um, in the Quran, do not do a favor expecting more in return and i love this especially in ramadan because in ramadan one of the things we get shebs you know is people just want to show you how much they're giving for charity you know everyone is on there on the phone you know there's there's all these charity events going on in every single muslim tv station is trying to raise money and and often what saddens me is i know people are well intended but it's almost like it becomes a competition who can show off how much they're giving and and bless them you know i i don't want to kind of undermine the fact that they're giving but i think sometimes we forget that we don't give in order to be seen to be giving or wanting something back even if that is a reward in the hereafter we should just be giving because that's the right thing to do and i think that for me anyway that that verse really sums that up and then one of the hadiths that i really love um it's it's really about just um you know, how merciful and how forthcoming God is if, if you kind of move towards him. And it says, if he comes to me walking, I go to him running. And it's this idea that, you know, if you make just the, the slightest effort in the direction of the divine, then the divine will come to you at twice the pace, you know, and it's, it's a beautiful thing, I think. To try to help people within the book, I feel as though when I'm reading the book, when I've read the, the verses and stuff, is to help people through Ramadan, it's to help people through the year. As you said, you can keep it in your pocket if you wanted to. It's a pocketbook. It's very small, as you can, as you can see. Was it important to have that in there to, to help yeah. people during Ramadan? I, I, think it's, I think it's important to say also that this was a book that I didn't come up with initially. The publisher came to me. Um, and they wanted to do a gift book for Ramadan, but they wanted it to be something that could be practically helpful as well. And this is why um, we worked together to come up with what is it that we could put in there that could help somebody through Ramadan. And so we came up with this idea of practical tips, practical advice. Um, um, there's a series in there that I call the prophetic character where I pick out elements of how the Prophet Muhammad's character is something we want to emulate and how we might do that. But one one example of, of a tip that's not directly connected to the prophetic character, for example, is the one on what might be roughly page 19. They're not numbered. And it's this idea of being conscious of the lonely. Most of us who are born Muslim, we belong to large Muslim families and communities, Shebs, and it's easy to forget that for many Muslims, this, there's this experience of extreme solitude during Ramadan, um, especially those that are new to Islam. Like we're, we're, we'll all celebrate a convert when they come and join us. Oh, well done, you know, you found the faith, you're one of us now. But we forget that when that fanfare and when that, you know, um, celebra celebratory moment has disappeared, this is somebody who's probably waking up for suhoor, you know, the, the meal we eat to start the fast on their own. This is somebody who's probably breaking fast on their own nine times out of ten. And and I'm very, uh, you know, it took me a long time to realize it. I'm very lucky I'm connected to a convert community for a number of reasons. And it's only when many of these um, converts, um, some of whom like to be called reverts, of course, uh, began to be more candid with me, maybe trust me with their with their darkness or their sadness and their sorrows, that I began to realize this. You know, I, I've it never even occurred to me because my normality has throughout my life has been somebody telling me to get up for suhoor and then eat with them. You know, <laughs> when I lived at home with my parents, I didn't have a choice. I had to do it. And here in our family, you know, if we do it, we do it together kind of thing. And the same for iftar. I, I, I don't think I've ever had an iftar on my own unless, of course, I'm on the road or something like that. Yeah. And yet when I spoke to these people, I realized, my God, so many of them 
are, are going through this. And so in the in in the book, one of the tips, this particular tip, is to try and reach out to these individuals if you know who they are. Not not in a way to kind of make them feel self conscious of things or whatever, but just you know invite them a little bit more than you might normally, and and just be conscious that maybe they're not experiencing Ramadan in the same festive and communal way that you are because they might they might be the only person who's Muslim in their family. Well, one thing I've just thinking whilst you were just just giving your answer there was do you have to be a muslim to pick it up you don't necessarily have to be do you you can be any, any, any race any faith whatsoever i mean let's let's up. be honest anybody who's going to pick up a book with quranic verses and hadith is going to feel immediately like this is a book for muslims there's no there's no getting away from that and and a non muslim most of my non muslim friends are bu are buying the book to give to muslims but i've had to point out to a few of them well, you know have a read some some of this stuff is going to be very useful to you because it is talking about universal things it, you know spirituality is a universal thing attachment to the material is a universal thing fasting is something that is very trendy right now i saw some headline today where our prime minister fasts every week you know and and of course coming from a hindu tradition that's not a surprise either because of course it's it's very much a part of the the hindu religious tradition as well so there are many universal um pearls of wisdom in here where do you see the book going what what would you like to not necessarily gain from it but what's your ultimate goal for writing a book like this it's it's really to be a source of strength and inspiration for people um not just in ramadan throughout the year but obviously let's be honest every ramadan i'm going to be pushing it that little bit more because it makes the perfect gift you know for somebody who you think could do with a little lift it's as you said it's a tiny little book that you can pop into your handbag you can pop into your jacket pocket you could be sitting on the bus nobody would even know you're reading it you could be sitting on the tube you could be sitting in the mosque and it's that kind of thing but also i think i really want it to kind of evoke the true spirit of islam because for me with everything that goes on in the world in this day and age and and with the public perception of islam i think a lot of the essence of the religion what it's really about which i think is embodied by ramadan gets lost I have a book that really focuses on those elements on 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 the spirit of islam in this way i think it's it's about you know trying to get that across to people you said something earlier and i haven't forgotten it you said you were actually approached to write this book yes. you didn't actually reach out to publishers and it's quite interesting after our last conversation last year about Ramadan I had a couple of people reach out to me and I wrote and we're talking about big publishers so I wrote a couple of articles about Eid, Iftar, Ramadan and then the one of the biggest tourism boards in London reached out to me they wanted to promote Ramadan so people are reaching out to us now the reason why I have a feeling why they're reaching out to us is because Ramadan could be seen as commercial outlet now, commercial standpoint. What, where do you see it going if it's going down this route where it could be used as a commercial standpoint? And you saw London last year for the first time ever that they had lights out and stuff. What, what's your take on that? Do, do you see? Do I you think, see that as a positive? Yeah, I think I think there are positives to gain from this, and there are negatives. As well, of course, um, you know, the, the word commercialism is probably the most negative aspect of this. And yet at the same time, you know, to, to be to be living in a city like London, where there is a huge Muslim population, so huge that almost like the majority of restaurants here are halal because they're conscious of this, for example. Yeah. Even the non-Muslim owned places are, are providing for this in a, in, a, in a city so big to finally have. Ramadan lights, whether whether you think they're um, you know Islamic or not, just just to be seen is is the point I'm making here. So when we see um, our identity, our faith, um, whatever you want to call it, being vis visibly acknowledged. Now the Ramadan lights might be something you might consider a little bit you know um borderline whether they're really part of the faith or not but then you have an event such as ramadan 10 which is humongous now 
You know, last year I went to the event um, in, in the Royal Albert Hall. They did one. Then I was invited to speak at one, which was at the highest point that you can actually stand in London in this new building in Bishopsgate. Everyone thinks it's a shard, but the top off, I mean, much of the top of the shard you can't access. Um, it's just the tallest in terms of height. Um, now, when you, when, you, when you have events like this being openly, um, not just tolerated, which is a word that suggests they're just putting up with you, but actively being invited to do these things in our city, in our country, in our homes, obviously, Shebs, that's a very big positive because we, we are often crying out to be seen. When I did some couple of work with, with some of the outlets, they, they had nothing to do with Ramadan or anything. They wanted to get involved. They realized the potential as well. That, yes. Uh, but also and there's, and there's the no commercial standpoint that. as well. Obviously for them as well, it was commercially, it would be great mm. because they'd be making some money out of it as well. Absolutely. So Absolutely. That, that was the thing I was trying to say, is that, is that, is that good or is that, is that? Well, that's the other that side of it, isn't it? Which I was going to get to. So. What, what I was telling you there with, with this Ramadan tent and everything, um, that for me is the positive of, of Ramadan being embraced, you might say, by the mainstream. But then there, there there's arguably a negative as well, the commercial side, as you say, where many, many, um, you know, companies, many organizations, many institutes, many commercial entities are going to view this as an opportunity. And, and let's be frank. Um, you know, all, all all kind of religious events, religious festivals are viewed like that by most commercial entities. It's just taken a little bit longer, maybe, for them to switch on to this. But whether it's Ramadan, Diwali, or Christmas, yeah, Christmas. Now our supermarkets are are decked out, you know, with all these festive greetings, and and again, some of us are happy that we're being seen and then others are going to talk about well they're just you know taking advantage of this and they don't really care about ramadan you know and, and when this publisher approached me this is this is just a mainstream publisher this has got nothing to do with islam they're not muslim or anything like that mainstream publisher they were very transparent yes we do want to do something that is obviously going to have a commercial um validity because ultimately books are businesses if they can't sell the thing they're not going to do it okay so i i i'm you, know, you have to be pragmatic i can completely appreciate that but then they were coming to me because they felt i would then also do it justice from a muslim perspective and i think that's where that's where the line has to be drawn and the balance has to be acquired. Ultimately, Chefs, we do live in a world that, let's be honest, um, worships at the church of capitalism. You know, it, that's, the, that's the religion of the world we really live in now. And, and so the rest of the religions have to find a way to kind of sit alongside that in a comfortable way, I guess. By the way, when I was growing up, I'm sure the same for you. When I would tell my friends, oh, I'm going to be fasting, they'd be like, fasting for what does that mean? What is Ramadan? Now, my, my sister, who's slightly a lot, lot younger than me, when, when she was growing up in school, she said, oh, I'm fasting. They knew what it was. Mm. So if you look at the, the time span in over 20, 30 years, it has gotten more mm. mainstream. And yeah. I, I, I feel as though it will be great to have this. It will, it will, it will highlight the, the, the community as well in a positive light because there's a lot of it to be quite honest with you there's a lot of negativity all the time mm. not all the time, of the course, not all the yeah, time. this is the yeah. point yeah so there's, there's a lot of negativity about muslims over the years islamophobia that's been rife for years and years and years this is a positive i think this will be good for the community for, for muslims as well to say hey look 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 what we do and books like yours is great it mm. helps i think Thank the you. industry it helps not just travel, it helps the entire world, really, doesn't it? So that, that is, is, I applaud you, I applaud the publisher for coming to you. Thank you. We're still a long way, you know, from where we want to be, but I, I, I don't think we'll ever be in an ideal. So we always have to just strive to try and get closer to, to, to what we feel is, is, you know, the right place. One of the things work and businesses also now recognise Ramadan as, and will give Muslims time off or yeah. give them... Flexibility, uh, flexibility which, working which, hours, which was not the case, by the way, and only Absolutely. even a couple, couple of years ago. And so that is that. So we're moving in the right direction, for sure. Which, which which is which is fantastic to see. And tell us where we can buy the book. I'm sure we can buy it in all good bookstores and online. And but also, you are doing events during Ramadan, so we are coming up. To yes. That. So you're doing events. Yeah. Right? So, so obviously, like obviously, as we said, this isn't a book that's going to kind of reach the kind of audiences maybe my previous book did minarets this is very much a book 
aimed at the at our Muslim community and targeting the Muslim community. So most of my events are within the Muslim community. Um, so I'm doing um, a, a wonderful um, series of events with institutes like um, Emerald, the Muslim Network Institute. I'm, I'm going to be appearing at Ramadan 10 at some point in one of their events. And all of this I'm going to put, put up on my socials at some point. And people can buy the book you know, in, in almost all of the usual bookstores and online spaces. But I'm also doing special signed copies myself from my website for anybody that wants them. Um, and I post them out for them as well. So people can also reach out to me if they if they want to give these as gifts, which is generally what most people are doing. What's on the agenda coming forward after Ramadan? What, 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 have you got more books? What, what, what's the yeah, what's yeah the I'm, I'm working on more books in the background. Um, I'm working on a follow-up to Minarets. Which is which is the big thing that's going on in the background. That's that's taken up a lot of my time. Uh, I've done most of the travelling for that, and I'm in the writing up process. And I'll be revealing and sharing tidbits on that very soon. I'm also trying to um, secure um, a writing residency. And again, until it until the you know the dots. What is it? The until you you kind of cross the T's yeah, and yeah, dot the I's. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to say anything because I'm nearly there. But I'll be talking about that as well. And both of them are very, very exciting projects. They're both in, in a very similar vein to the kind of literature that I've written in the past. And so people who are interested should just, you know, keep an eye on my socials. I'll be I'll be saying some interesting things probably in the next few months, for sure. And just, and just remind everyone what your socials are. Yeah, so um, I'm Tarek Hussain on almost all of the socials, and in on on X it's underscore Tarek Hussain, and on Instagram it's Tarek underscore Hussain. But you you'll know who it is because I've got the same facial shot on all of them. Well, brilliant. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate your time, Tarek. Enjoy Ramadan, and I'll speak to you very soon. Thanks for having me on, Chebs. It's always a pleasure. Bye bye, mate. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and hit the bell button to never miss an episode and watch all my previous episodes from the show. You can also follow me on all my social media platforms. That's it for Take A Wonder Shebs. Hope to see you all soon. Until next time, bye for now.